A very good morning, distinguished guests, delegates, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me immense pleasure to extend to you all a very warm welcome on behalf of Jindal Global University at the Association of Indian Management Schools, Northern Region Roundtable of Deans and Directors of B Schools on managing the future. I would like to invite Dr. Tapan Panda, Dean Jindal Global Business School, to deliver his welcome address. Thank you. Maybe the students can settle down. Uh, good morning to all of you. And uh, I take uh, this opportunity to welcome all the guests those who have come here, um, including uh, our Vice Chancellor, Professor Raj Kumar. Uh, in 2013, I was teaching at uh, ISP Hyderabad, and a couple of officers were, police officers were undergoing training at National Police Academy. So in the evening, a couple of uh, people invited me to National Police Academy. Next day, I was teaching them. And from a distance, I could see a uh, person sitting there always with this closed uh, jacket. And around 25 police officers were around him. And he was really impressing upon these 25 people. That's how I, I met uh, Professor Raj Kumar first time in my life, 2013. And of course, uh, during the uh, last three, four years, uh, we have crossed each other in many parts. And then 2016, we met and we interacted. And I decided to come and join here. The only change that has happened between 2013 and 2016 is that Raj has got some more gray hairs. <laughs> but if you look at his indomitable spirit, his vision, that continues to inspire many people, including me, to come and work with him. So I would like to welcome Raj to this event of Jindal Global Business School. Thank you for finding time for us. So when Professor Rabi and uh, Professor Rajesh, I think Rajesh is not here. Oh, yes, yeah, he's there. Okay. And Professor Pankaj, three of my deans. So when these three deans uh, told me one day that we are going to see somebody very senior and we'll have a discussion, I was a bit skeptic about that part, you know. I went to a school in Orissa. Orissa is one of the poor places, you know. I went into a school, it's a government school. So, but my school produced very bright students. That includes Dr. Lalit Man Singh, Devdutt Patnaik, all of that part. Mm -hmm. In my class, there were six, seven very bright students. Mm -hmm. Out of which six of them went to civil services. Five, six of them are around Khan market, right? <laughs> I know that uh, over a period of time, they had so much of material gain. And on the human quality index, they have gone down. So that kind of a mindset you have got when you talk about civil servants. So I was a bit skeptic and I was also running late to meet sir there. But luckily we went to his house and I never expected that sir will really host the way he hosted us. I still remember the hot samosa and gulab jamuns which sir served us there in his house. And when we were going up, I was joking with Rajesh and Pankas saying that I won't climb the steps there. But while coming out of his house, he was so kind, he came down three floors through the steps to say goodbye to all of us. So thank you for accepting our invitation. Mr. Sunil Arora is a retired IS officer. <laughs> and currently Director General and CEO of Indian Institute of Corporate Affairs, Ministry of Corporate Affairs, but he has a long illustrious career. And uh, he is one of the persons who looked at a desert, dead land, and he said that there can be a city here. And he looked at those dead land and said there can be a Japanese city here. So when he walked in Rajasthan cadet, as the MD of Ritko, he did really a lot of industrialization there. He has a lot of stories to tell you about what he did with Indian Airlines when he was heading it, how he established the skill and entrepreneurship uh, department in Government of India. He's also, well, he has worked as the Secretary of Information and Broadcasting there. So I welcome you to our event there. Uh, it was, I think, 93, I, after my MBA in 1993, Couple of years in advertising, I worked with a mad fellow called Subrata Sen Gupta. If you have read his books, he was a clarion bets. He was my boss. Then I decided to uh, become a professor, not because I was scared of that fellow, but I thought I should focus on that part. So I am from Orissa, so I was thinking I should work at some other place. So I appeared an interview in Indore, and I got my first job outside Orissa. And later on in 2005, when I joined IM Indore, I met this gentleman again in Indore. He has been very nice to me. He is present here, Dr. Rupinder Dhar. Right? I welcome you, sir, to this event. <laughs> so I could, have be, he could have become, I could have become his staff at that point of time, but I pursued my PhD. And in 96, I think it is 96, in the year 96, I was attending an international conference and I was terribly sick. 
right at that point of time so this lady who was sitting next to me and she asked me about my health issues and she picked up some medicines from her purse and then another gentleman walked in and he said something in uh, i think it was marathi when that conversation happened and for next three year three days in during the conference i was taken good care by both husband and wife and i'm so happy to see dr josie here please welcome dr josie here So 96 to 2017, it has been 23 years, but I still remember the love and affection that you have given me from that period of time. I'm happy to see you here, sir. Uh, last uh, meet executive council meeting, I had got a chance to meet our new president of Association of Indian Management Schools, and uh, we had a small, very good conversation at that point of time. And I suggested that we should host this event and we should we should be here for this event, and he kindly agreed. And uh, I think out of the 720, we are the 720th school. we are the engaged school inducted into aims and he agreed for this event i'd also like to thank my friend goa from goa who wanted to take it to goa <laughs> but i said no i'll be doing this event here sir welcome you sir for this event <laughs> and 2000 uh, i think 2011 professor bala while i was working in chennai told me that we have to do accreditation and accreditation was not a buzzword in im system you know we are we believe that we are good people it was not required for doing that part but suddenly once this was offered to us it was a lot of work that i need to do on accreditation part and i looked up to professor mm -hmm. there i met him also after a long time here so thank you sir for finding some time to come here he is a vice president of mc here professor nand gopal and also mr todari raman i met in that point of time so it's good that you are here i feel very happy to invite uh, both of you here and welcome all other delegate members who are present here sir this is uh, jindal global business school is uh, from 6 7 years old only in that sense when you are coming from uh, schools which have longer uh, period of time but we have a big vision and our vision is influenced by what our founder chancellor talks about what our founder vice chancellor talks about and we are trying to execute those vision in coming period of time I have my all young colleagues who are present here and student present here. I'll also welcome all of them. And there are few people who have played a great role behind this show. Professor Ravi is one of them. Professor Brajesh is there, and all other my colleagues. So you are here, Professor Pankaj here. I welcome all of them. Now, thank you, and I'll hand over to you. I would now like to call upon our Vice Chancellor, Dr. C. Raj Kumar, to give his inaugural address. A very good morning to all of you. It is indeed my proud privilege to welcome all of you to the OP Jindal Global University as well as the Jindal Global Business School on behalf of the Association of Indian Management Schools as well as the Jindal Global University. It is my proud privilege to welcome all of you to the university and also uh, to the Northern Region Roundtable entitled Managing for the Future. It is also my proud privilege to recognize the presence and also uh welcome mr sunil arora director general and ceo of the indian institute of corporate affairs dr neeraj gupta head school of corporate governance and public policy at the iica dr bv sangwikar who is uh, the dean and faculty of management uh, at the savitribai phule pune university also representing uh, aims here also many other distinguished uh, colleagues uh, whom uh, tapan had already welcomed um it's a, indeed a very special occasion for us because of the fact that uh, there are managing for the future is a very important agenda that we would like to contribute towards and as young leaders who are part of our business school as well as uh, mentors and faculty members and business leaders who have come together uh, there are a number of issues that need to be addressed um let me start with a very interesting i was uh, a sort of a classic interesting india story that i want to share with you uh, it's connected to the university but as uh, management professionals i'm sure uh, you will have a take on it so in the year 2008 uh, i was involved in acquiring land in this place uh, the whole campus as you see it was a big piece of land and we acquired the land and uh, we we didn't get any concession from the government so we literally purchased the land from the market and then began the process of doing everything uh, you know the conversion of land use and all of that in early 2009 the government of haryana passed a legislation establishing the university on 27 january 2009 and then we began the construction of the campus and while that was happening uh, and sometime in the month of june 
uh, we were in the advanced stage of construction. A few months later, we were going to begin the academic session. A very distinguished professor from the United States was visiting us. And I was very conscious. I had a sort of a porta cabin there where I was sitting there and also monitoring the construction. And uh, we were supposed to entertain this professor from the United States. So I, and it was obviously very hot. You can imagine the month of June. So I wanted to be sure that my office organizes an air-conditioned car for this uh, professor and uh, it was sent to pick this uh, professor from the airport. Um, he, of course, uh, went to the airport, picked him up, and then uh, this car was, it was from a private travel agency, and the car was brought, uh, and he, the professor was brought to my uh, place. And he was, of course, sweating and a uh, little bit, uh, you know, uh, not very comfortable. But then I told him that, so are you okay? I asked him. So he said, that, oh, everything is fine. Uh, but just that, you know, uh, it was too hot and there was no air conditioner. And I was a little surprised because I consciously took a decision to ensure that the air conditioned car goes to him. So I asked my office to check and my office checked with the agency and said and confirmed to me in five minutes that yes, it was a air conditioned car that was booked and it was sent. And we continued the meeting, we chatted about half an hour or so, but this thing was bothering me. So then I told my office that, listen, I want to talk to the head of this uh, travel agency because you know I'm, I'm not happy about this. So they connected me to the head of the travel agency. I spoke to this person. Listen, I booked this air-conditioned car, and a very distinguished professor from the United States is here, and he's uh, sweated his way through. Uh, then he said, no, sir, we booked an air-conditioned car for you, and uh, we have sent an air-conditioned car. OK, I, I didn't want to continue the conversation because this professor was also waiting, and we had to continue our business discussion about what we want to do. And then towards the end of it, we had lunch and all of that, and the car was still waiting here. So it was simply bothering me. So I called the driver and, um, and uh, to my office, uh, the porta cabin where I was, and I asked him, you know, when air conditioned car book and uh, what happened? And I was saying that. So then he said, Sir, air conditioned car is hai, lekin now he air conditioning kaam nahi kar hai. <laughs> So he basically said, and I was so angry. But when he said it in a very, very confident tone, sir, it's an air-conditioned car, but it's not working today. So then, since then, I learned a very important lesson uh, living and working in India that I began to say that I need working air-conditioner. <laughs> so, uh, and I say this uh, for all of you as leaders and young leaders who are going to shape the future of India and the world, is that managing for the future involves a far greater thinking about the future, a far deeper understanding of the present and the kind of unique challenges that we in India have, not just the last mile problem, maybe even the first mile problem. And so the question that really we need to ask is that what kind of a society that we are trying to build in and how do we improve the simple efficiency of our governance systems which can help us advance the big ideas that we are trying to promote. And this aspect goes deep down to all aspects of public policy formulation as well as governance of our country itself. The second thing which I would like to uh, briefly flag upon is that today more than ever uh, the business education but also other aspects of education has not yet come to terms with the idea of ethics and its integral part of everything that we do. And so ethics and integrity need to be deeply embedded in every aspect of what we do and that's a big challenge. Um, for those of you who are familiar with this, uh, and I suppose the young people may not be so familiar with it but many others would be, that um, um, and again, I'll give you a personal anecdote. Uh, when we moved to India in the year 2008, uh, we were trying to purchase a property in Delhi. And very quickly, uh, and one of the basic conditions I had was, as a law professor, I was even more conscious of uh, being a law-abiding citizen. So I said that, you know, we, the only thing we will do is we will do a, a, a full check-based transaction and what he was uh, uh, generally known as a white money property and now of course we know about the black money and all of that um, and very quickly I realized that the brokers and others who were trying to get a property told us that uh, it's impossible it's just not happening uh, then they said finally they made me meet some people and they were saying uh, you know normally we do 70-30 uh, 
because you are insisting we can do 60-40. So 60% black money and 40% white money. Um, uh, or, uh, so in some ways, the, it was impossible to be able to actually uh, engage in a transaction for buying a property without doing it in an illegal manner, in the sense, and the beauty of that is, so anyway, to cut the story short, so I told this, uh, finally I told the seller that it's not possible for us to do this, and then he said, all right, I'll do it, uh, we will do it, you just give 20% more than what you, I would have liked you to pay. Um, so I said, fine, and by the time my friends and my uh, uh, relatives who were trying to help me do this, they just disappeared from the scene. They thought we've gone mad uh, to be able to do this, so we went ahead with it. And then, just uh, we did the uh, agreement to sale, and then when the time when we were closing the sale deed, the seller backed out and said that I won't be able to do this because uh, if we are going to register this property, for the price that you're going to pay. The, there were six others who were around your house. Those guys have come back and they are going to be in deep trouble. So we, I just can't do it. So I said then I went on a big uh, lecture with him about ethics and integrity and the fact that I'm teaching law and we need to build a rule of law society and how can I violate the law, particularly when I am teaching students to adhere to the rule of law. And then he looked at me and said, all right, 30%. So you give 30% more and we'll close it. So we ended up paying 30% more than what the seller was legitimately asking just to ensure that we register the property for the price that we were paying. And we did it and we feel, we personally feel happy about it, but uh, it's also a foolish thing to do in the context in which we are discussing things. So in a way, one of the big issues, and of course our Prime Minister has been fervently talking about it, about the fact that we need to create an ethical society, a society that is based upon the rule of law, where businesses and individuals can function within the basic framework of law, and people know that if they violate the law, there are going to be consequences, and it is the best interest of everybody that law will favor people who are abiding it. The third thing which I would like to also briefly mention is the fact that institution building is central to nation building. Unfortunately, we in our country have been developing many institutions, but the, over the years also destroyed many institutions. Uh, there was a time 2000 years ago when institutions such as Nalanda, Takshila and many Vikramshila and other institutions were truly world class institutions of learning. But post-independent India saw the establishment of great institutions, but very quickly they deteriorated in academic standards and they were not able to create the vision and imagination that requires pursuit of excellence. Because of which today, not a single Indian university is one of the top 200 in the world in any rankings, particularly the Times Higher Education ranking. And while Indian universities and business schools and law schools have been performing at a relatively mediocre level, universities in South Korea, Taipei, Hong Kong, Singapore, mainland China have created world-class institutions and today they are figuring in the top 200 in the world. In fact, recently I wrote a paper which has looked at the last five years of rankings of universities and you will find zero across India in the last five years in these rankings, but you will find Chinese institutions, institutions in Singapore, Hong Kong, South Korea, Taipei and others coming above. Uh, including the governance aspect of these institutions have been a major challenge. Uh, we know for sure that the 46 central universities are suffering from over 40% of faculty positions lying vacant, including my own alma mater, University of Delhi, which has over 45% faculty positions lying vacant. The IITs and IIMs, our premier institutions of excellence, have over 35% of faculty positions lying vacant. The state universities across the country have over 50% faculty <coughs> positions lying vacant. So in some ways it is not only the question of quality and excellence that we are falling short, but the, the governance of our institutions have also been a challenge. I say this also with a full sense of responsibility that it doesn't need to be like this. 
We have played such leadership role in many things, including in the advancement of science and technology and some of our great institutions such as the Indian Institute of Science Bangalore and CSIR and ISRO and such institutions, many of them established by the government. Um, I believe that the making of India through the establishment and development of institutions of excellence is more important than make in India because we will not be able to succeed in our make in India efforts unless we are able to help towards the making of India where institutions are to be the pivotal role in which excellence could be promoted. I want to end by thanking all of you for your presence. I want to particularly thank Mr. Arora for his presence as I know that he has made outstanding contributions towards promoting good efforts in public policy formulation as well as institution building, all of which have contributed to the nation building agenda that we are promoting here. I particularly want to thank and congratulate Dean Tapan Panda and his distinguished colleagues, Professor Gupta, as well as uh, Rajesh and others, uh, including the colleagues who have helped us in organizing this conference, um, including Professor Ravi Agarwal. Um, I also want to thank uh, and appreciate the presence of the students here. I sincerely hope that you continue to engage in the course of the day and make the best of uh, your experience here. I have always believed that universities are fundamentally transformative institutions where what happens in the classroom is only one part of your experience. What happens outside the classroom in these forums are sometimes even more inspiring and hopefully transformative. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. We are pleased to have amongst us Dr. B.V. Sangvikar, President of All India Management School. Dr. Sangvikar has around 20 years of experience in teaching, industry, research with nationally reputed institutes and companies, presently dean, faculty of management professor in Department of Management Science at Savitri Phule Pune University. I now invite sir to give his special address. A very good morning to all of you. <coughs> Dignitaries on the dais. Dignitaries on the dais. Honorable Vice Chancellor Dr. C. Rajkumar. Dr. Sunil Arora. Dr. Tapan Kumar Panda. Dr. Ravi Kumar, past president of AIMS, Dr. Ashok Joshi, Dr. Rupinder Dhar, executive board members of AIMS, leaders from industry, Mr. Raman, <coughs> deans and directors of various business schools, and dear students. First of all, I would like to thank Dr. Sri Rajkumar and Dr. Tapan Kumar Panda for hosting this particular round table conference for deans and directors of business schools. We are thankful to both of you. Also, I would like to thank leaders from various industries and deans and directors for attending this particular round table conference. The theme selected by Tapan Kumarji for this particular round table, that is the managing for future. That is the most relevant and we must now think what exactly lies there in future. And this particular topic is very close to everybody's heart because everybody is very curious what exactly is going to happen in future. And particularly here, we are trying to understand what exactly is the future of management institution, business schools in India. And as an association of Indian management school, it is really a very prime concern for all of us. Here I would like to take a, just a small review of how our <coughs> business schools, how our management institutions are performing 
if you will observe since last uh, few decades management education has been one of the most coveted discipline globally applicants or students they seek for the quality business education which can fast track their understanding about the various economical issues and business issues corporate firms are also looking for job ready individuals who can understand the bigger picture and contribute to their growth stories business school graduates are also driving changes through their leadership positions across the industries and various industry sectors being relative a very uh, recent discipline and the one that is very context specific management education now must go undergo various massive changes today's mantra is innovate or die and our business schools must adopt this because they need to stay relevant in this competitive world we must appreciate the changes in the way uh, business schools are handling the way they are designing their curriculum the way they have adopted their business pedagogies and the way they are handling various stakeholders of these business schools if we will observe the last decade has seen two major significant changes in the management school in the management school or management education the first was in terms of the student profile and that was diversity came into the focus many institutions they started the scholarship programs even they started special scholarship for the women students they started scholarship programs for the students having the experience even they started changing the entry criteria apart from only the entrance test they had added few many additional criteria while accepting and by accepting this this type of trends we we got the students from various strata of the society another second if you will observe what what what, what exactly is unique about the business education that was the industry involvement increasing senior executive they became more conscious of the importance of contributing to the education and they were willing to make the time for their visits to the various business schools they came on board as the mentors visiting faculty guest speakers and even with the research collaborations they offered live projects over and above the industry internships and which gave the students an opportunity to learn in the real world setting under the guidance of seasoned professionals looking ahead we can see these two trends emerging one is the globalization of management education and the other is the increasing use of technology now dear friends i would i would not like to take this review for you what exactly we need to think for the future of business education the future of management education in india will be determined by its capacity to adapt the change, changing economic environment and we need to shape it through the high quality research and innovative teaching curriculum with the deep engagement through our collaborations with business and other stakeholders business management education needs to emphasis on boundary crossing skills build on the specialized knowledge our approach needs to include collaboration communication leadership problem solving and critical thinking with the help of all our stakeholders we need to focus on innovation in management and particularly innovation in business management education our future leaders will be developed from the shared knowledge across the disciplines we need to teach multiple perspectives including integration of design thinking with business analytics we need to adopt approach of experiential learning which will provide the opportunity to have real world issues and our problems to solve we need to agree that businesses and business school should focus on developing innovative leaders as well as as well as environmental sustainability and social impact which are very essential for india's economic competitiveness and progress and the development of innovative tools for improving our business education such as we, we we need to develop our business leader 
with the core 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 responsibilities and this particular responsibility lies with the business school now this will happen this will happen only if our institutions are able to respond and our institution are able to respond and anticipate the major changes coming in economics technological and organizational changes now we at association of indian management schools we have a greater role in this particular making of future of management of education sustainable now we need to undertake a study on future needs of management education in india in in particularly globalized perspective and at aims we are going to undertake this particular stu study we are going to form one study uh, study group working group on this particular area and we, we we wish to understand how exactly our business management education in india will be we need to take initiative and we need to exhibit our commitment to the intellectuals gathering and dissemination of best practices in innovative and experiential learning we need to facilitate inform information sharing promotion and dissemination of best practices followed by various business schools in india and abroad we need to encourage our members to share their best practices in education and research we must have our network very strong so that we will be able to face any challenge with the help of each other we need to establish links with the industry bodies not only to improve the perception of our business education and research but we need to identify common issues and explore ways to jointly achieve these key objectives we need to encourage a more comprehensive model of measuring impact and improving the business school research we need to improve our core business infrastructure we need to have proper planning uh, for our succession we need to develop teaching learning uh, uh, resource portal which will be shared by all our members we will be supporting we need to support our all members to meet the national and international business education standards finally we need to address the issues related to curriculum development technology deployment and experiential learning and management education can deliver the leaders that are demanded by the business communities and this will collaborate this collaborative approach will help developing management and management education with the innovation capability and that will transform india's long term prospects with these words i would like to conclude my talk thank you so much for inviting all of us here to the jindal global university thank you so much thank you sir we are honored to have amongst us shri sunil arora as our chief guest mr arora is the director general and ceo indian institute of corporate affairs ministry of corporate affairs government of india having served as a secretary ministry of information and broadcasting mr arora is 1980 batch indian administrative service officer of rajasthan cadre He has also served as managing director in Indian Airlines and credited with turnaround of the organization which bounced back to profit from losses. He has also served as a joint secretary, Minister of Civil Aviation, secretary to Chief Minister and principal secretary to Chief Minister and handled information and public relations, industries and investment departments. I now request sir to come and deliver his keynote address. professor dr c v rajkumar dr sangvikar ravi agrawal ji tapan panda ji my colleague neeraj gupta ji from isc members of the distinguished audience and students from various faculties just now it was said that a working group is going to be appointed to further examine the understanding of management institutions education before i dilate on what i have to say i'd like to say one thing with due apologies having been in the government for 30 more than 36 years after about 2 3 years i learned 
two things. And the two most dangerous words are agreed in principle. <laughs> Something gone for six months, if not more. And the second most dangerous phrase is we'll appoint a group, empowered group, working group, etc., etc. <laughs> gone for two years. <laughs> <laughs> they always start that. The, lib the, the Libran Commission had a mandate of six months, and the final report came after 14 years, <laughs> if not more. So my request is that all our ministries, libraries, they have so much literature on the wonderful working groups who have kind of already disseminated their wisdom in writing. Uh, on every aspect of education, that it's time we kind of take it forward instead of appointing another working group. While having the discussions with, the, while I called on Dr. Rajkumar, so I asked him two, three areas what he would like me to speak on. He said skill would be a good area, and I was happy he said that. I happen to be the, this is not a hagiography by any means, <laughs> and I'll try to restrict it to the bare bone facts, <laughs> in which since I was the first secretary, so even as I try to avoid the usage of, unnecessarily the usage of word I, I'll have to sometimes say it, because I had nothing to fall back upon in terms of precedent in the government system. On 29th August 2014, I got a call that I should join as skills secretary in what was that time Department of Skills, part of Ministry of Youth and Sports. Within the next two days, dutifully came, joined on 2nd September, our wedding anniversary, and uh, went to the gentleman who was holding secretary youth was having the additional charge the last two months because the notification for skill department was issued by the government, the present government, on 30th or 31st July 2014. So I went to him and I asked him that, uh, okay, now let's have a, a briefing session and uh, where do I sit? He says, you have to find out. I said, who all are going to work with me? He says, you have to create them. I have already made arrangement that I'll give you one PA on loan from youth, one PA, one PS, and one MTS for odd jobs, and one computer programmer. <coughs> and now he also gave me a samosa. <laughs> <laughs> and the meeting was over. And besides telling me one or two issues, the meeting was practically over. It was going to be over, in fact, I said, I have this NSDA, NSDC, which also at that time was with the Department of Economic Affairs. I said, maybe I'd like to go to one of their offices and sit there and have an initial talk. He said, I have a dental appointment. My office is available to you for three hours. So God save the dentists. I'm mean, very happy about it, with all due regards. Three hours we spent with the DG of NSDA and uh, CEO of NSDC of that time, just to understand the issues. Anyway, luckily for him, he didn't have another dental appointment, so I was again back on the road. The most fortunate thing to start with which happened was that when I went to call on Mr. Sonowal, the then minister, who is now the CM of Assam, he said that, I know you don't have any place to sit. What you do is that you start sitting in my with three rooms which I have got in the Sports Authority building, which I have as chairman. And then we'll take it forward. <laughs> now I had two choices. Anybody in my place would have only these two, three stark choices. One was to brood over it. And after having been additional chief secretary home, Rajasthan, chairman of this corporation, that corporation, now you are at a situation at the age of 58 when 
you have to create everything including the basic structures the second was that and this is more relevant for my friends there and the second was that you start interacting with the stakeholders roughly about 70 75% of your time and 20 25% of your time you <coughs> keep on arranging for the logistics we didn't have any mr jindal to give us 500 crore to start with as mr rajkumar got despite the porta cabin uh it's easier to say now it's difficult and it can be difficult for any of us and on the other hand the prime minister the present prime minister's pointed focus <coughs> on certain areas one is skills and subsequently one realized when one attended some meetings in the pmo in which pm himself was presiding that the it was not just a kind of a pulpit focus it was a very deep focus because having been cm of gujarat for many years besides many other things he had very very deep insight into the skilling issues now what are one or two basic facts ministry of labor says that we have about 3 to 4% people who are skilled sometimes their website says 2 and 1/2% sometimes says 3% out the limit is 4% that is right also and wrong also because in this country we have billions of people who are skilled but not certified whether you take the varanasi kanchipuram weavers the diamond artisans of surat the german jewelry people of jaipur this entire ferozabad belt chicken workers of lucknow so leather people from agra millions of them are skilled but not certified at this time i'll just leave this point here only and come back to it later then when we started this uh, uh consultation with stakeholders i think those next 3 4 months what probably and will remain the most humbling period of anybody's life i found this i'll take some names because most of them are very young people can't take all names because they'll take a lot of time i found this aditya saikia relocated from rothschilds working in bhubaneswar in northeast his friend from stephens abinav dr mukti mishra their mentor <coughs> relocated from australia working in bhubaneswar i gradually started knowing alim chandani totally him i met incidentally in the how india skill conference uh visually impaired and professor in this university in washington dc which specializes in the impairment uh, issues and he is teaching there as a professor and i am glad to report to you physically relocated to india in delhi next month going to start his center in delhi what i am trying is dr vipin paul phd from michigan university ceo of two three companies there relocated to hyderabad is into bfsa and it space training thousands of people in chennai bangalore and bangalore so i'm sorry and hyderabad vishwesh kulkarni from pune arranging the training of these kids in factories like baba kalyani and then placing them a father son duo bhoglez in ahmedabad so much first generation industrialists come 
completely committed to skilling our youngsters in their own factory. What I am trying to make out is that we have islands and islands of excellence. But we are such a big nation and the problem is so huge in every which way that these islands need to be expanded, expanded and expanded even while maintaining the quality outcomes. Now coming back to the issue of those people who are trained but not certified, we realize that this is called technically recognition of prior learning, that we had an excellent framework, national skill qualification framework, which was issued by the government in December 2013, even before this department came into existence formally. And that kind of matches the skills of people to certify them in order that they could improve their chances in India or abroad by having formal certification. Mr. Ramad Rai of TCS was heading the NSDA. I went across to him and when he came to Delhi to his house. And I said, sir, other things apart, if you could just activate this NSQF because you are the chairman of that committee, other things can wait. And with your experience inside vision, this is not a difficult thing. And I am glad to report to you that last heard more than 10,000 occupation standards and quality, uh, this had been cleared by various committees. I think 5,000 got cleared during Mr. Ramad Raj's time. They have, uh, they do it both ways. They do it NOS, that is called National Occupation Standard, and they do it qualification pack. Now, this pen would have maybe 13 small, small like, sub-verticals, which are the occupational standards. But as a whole, it has got a qualification pack. So this is what the beauty of this NSQF is. It's just like a cockpit. You have so many things, weather, so many things, but in totality, the pilot has to kind of coordinate all those things, and that is the qualification pack. So finally, the country has the NSQF framework has started getting operationalized in a very big way. And I wish why I have mentioned it at some length is that with a visionary like Dr. Raj Kumar, if something could be done to make in this university that activity global or at least pan-Indian, it will be a very big service to the country. Anyway, finally, in December, we got some place to sit, which is the present office of uh, Shivaji Stadium, in, uh, where we have an office now, our ministry. We also found in the system that we had been given ITIs in the original notification. ITIs are adjunct to skills, but we also found that in the system that somebody had a food, had kind of uh, forgotten to delete ITAs from the mandate of labor. It took us good eight months to get this uh, small comma full stop thing rectified. And that also somehow things reached the Honorable Prime Minister himself, how they reached is a different story. And it was done overnight. And we got all the 11,000 ITAs and a couple of entrepreneurship institutes, including Nisbet in Guwahati and in Noida and etc. At that time, one very interesting incident happened. One of the bright joint secretaries sitting at a sensitive place told me, Sir, our jandan ka function ho gaya. Our swach bharat ka function ho gaya. Ab aave skill ka bhi karwa do. So, mein ka bhi function karwa ke bolunga kya. Mein paas daftar nahi hai, aadmi nahi hai, ye bolunga kya. Sir, aave to PM ko bolwa lo. Mein PM se kya karwa hoonga. Anyway, we scummed the, call it temptation, suggestion, weight, pressure, whatever. Ultimately, the skill mission was formally launched on 15th July, the World Youth Skills Day, 2015. 
and four things were done. A new national skill and entrepreneurship policy was announced, approved by cabinet of this country. Common norms were rationalized, approved by the cabinet of this country. Pradhan Mantri Kaushal Vikas Yojana was launched learning from the earlier uh, STAR scheme. All the learnings were incorporated and for the first time recognition of prior learning, which I said in the beginning, in the context of artisans, was formally included as a part of Pradhan Mantri Kaushal Vikas Yojana, again approved by cabinet. All the ideas were got migrated. NSDA and NSDC finally migrated, <coughs> shifted from Department of Economic Affairs to Skills. And the ministry started kind of, and I believe, and sub, most important, a national mission was created under Prime Minister with some chief ministers on board, some industry people on board. I think till recently, Somebody from Tata is there, and Manish Sabarwal is there, from Team Lees, some other people are there, from the industry side. That mission met recently, you must have seen the papers, I think it was July of this year, and they have taken some seminal decisions which have far-reaching import in the skilling and entrepreneurship space. It's a very, very difficult space, and I think, uh, we all need to kind of see to it. Another problem of this space is that uh, where the education has a role to play, that now you get these guys skilled, the new guys, forget the RPL guys, they are already in jobs. Where are the jobs? And now the jobs will have to be created only if the industry industrial manufacturing activity takes place at a fast pace and also if the educational institutions, including the higher education institutions, kind of train those trainers in the job space as well as skilling space who in turn will have a cascading influence on the market. I know it's easier said than done, but as a citizen, as a civil servant, and as somebody who handled this space for some time, it was a sheer luck that I was the first, that in the current financial year and the next financial year, call it financial year, call it calendar year, if we are not able to make a significant difference in the skilling and entrepreneurship space, entrepreneurship I will come just now after this, we would have lost the bus once again. On the entrepreneurship side, seminars and seminars, subgroups and subgroups. You have brilliant kids waiting to be entrepreneurs, willing to be entrepreneurs, leaving their jobs all over Europe, USA, coming back. But we cannot let them founder or flounder on the rocks of availability of easy credit, availability of working capital, immediate availability of a small piece of land in case they are into IT space and a larger piece of land in case they are into manufacturing space. We have brilliant people, I tell you. As Hector Industries, I met a gentleman, Amit Rajput. He said, we didn't have any appointment. He just walked in. He told me that he was the first entrepreneur in Bivari. He was engineer not from any hot shot institute, but somewhere near Bulandshire. He started with 400 square meter plot because Hero, uh, whom, whose marketing you have done, Shubanda, uh, they asked him to make a small component for them. And from there, he had come to me seeking land for 8th factory. 8th factory. 
I got a visit from one Shrikant Badwe, Pune. Started with two or three hundred square meter plot, engineer from somewhere in hinterlands of Maharashtra. His ninth factory in automobile space. Makes parts for BMW, makes parts for Mercedes, makes parts for Audi. Name an international company and he's making parts for them. I couldn't see his unit in Rajasthan. When I went to Pune, I went to his unit. You get, it looks like a kind of, at one time, our late Prime Minister Pandit Nehru said, these are the temples about dams. These are the new temples. And these are the new real idols, these people. Six factories, seven factories, eight factories, starting from zero. And similarly, if we are able to, another question which at a policy level, maybe Dr. Rao would like to, Dr. Uh, Rajkumar would like to examine is, in the entrepreneurship space, in the current scenario, with the ultra-right or more far to the right regimes coming everywhere, at least in parts of Europe, large parts of Europe, or if they, even if they are not coming, you have Brexit, you have now uh, major change in USA, almost a tremor in USA. Uh, would our entrepreneurs who have made big be able to survive? I am told that Uber, for example, has kept a war chest of three billion US dollars, if not more. And if their driver earns 700 rupees per day here, they give 500 per day as incentive. So is Amazon. So will our own people who last 8, 10, 15 years, who brought up their, who kind of grew in this space, would they survive? On the, on the other hand, since we are a global village, is the talk of protectionism even kind of passe, even on this forum? But also, not, we shouldn't be forgetting the fact that in our own nearby China, they have a different polity altogether. But they have been able to kind of, uh, one way or the other, uh, find some kind of a harmonizing between their own players and these international players. They have more or less made them get absorbed into their system and not take over their system. So I'm sure this would be discussed, deliberated at a policy level by people like you who sit on the high tables of consultancies and some solutions found. For today, I think I'll not say more. Uh, the last thing I would like to say is that uh, we keep on CSR has become one of the most kind of, uh, you keep on flogging it all the time. What is the kitty, by the way? 11 to 14,000 crores, different estimates. Most optimistic estimate is 14, and the most uh, kind of realistic estimate is 12. Bit of pessimistic estimate is 11. Last year spent 2014, 15, 15, 16 figures are not out as yet. 8,000 crores. I have sent a delegation of my officers and experts from Skill Ministry of Germany. Their government and their Chamber of Commerce gave a presentation only on dual learning, which is the kids spending almost one year out of their two-year ITI equivalent space in the factory instead of two to three months as in our country. The government spends of government spend of Germany that time was three billion euros. Industry spend, Mr. Rajkumar and Dr. Sangvikar, was 18 billion euro. Because industry sees value in that. And industry will not see value in that. Either it will be a self-realization like this Bogle parents, couple, I mean father, son, duo in Ahmedabad. But we can't wait for that. Or there would be so many ways of making industry uh, realize that if they have a kid who has done two months on the shop floor 
as against a kid who has done 10 months, they'll have to spend far less on retaining him or her and can utilize him or her right away. That will cost money, but that's every penny is worth it. I'll end by, because our youngsters are here, I'll end by saying that, especially for a whole lot of you, they say that, Havadas se lado, tund lehro se uljo. Havadas se lado, tund lehro se uljo. Kahan tak chaloge kinare kinare. They also say, and with right reasons, ki maya kela hi chala tha, janibe manzil magar, log saath aate gaye, aur karma banta gaya. Thank you.